My vision is this. If enough states vote for a public funding of elections at the state level, a critical mass will form and it will go federal. And that when it goes federal, we're going to be a different kind of a country. It's going to be we the people. And I who walk 3,200 miles across this country as a pilgrim, walking until given shelter, fasting until given food, never went without a bed, never went without a meal. Because we are good, kind people, and we love each other. And that's what we are going to be. We're going to stop being greedy and trying to, to steal the people's resources. We're going to instead be our brother's keeper. Be kind, be good. And we don't need wars. We just need to sit down and talk with each other. As I am 97 years old, I really did not expect still to be walking and talking when the career of men, including Karl Rove and Tony Snow and Scooter Libby and Bob Ney and Senator Larry Craig and David Vitter and Mark Foley and probably Ted Stevens and Pete Dominici and a few others find their sudden ends. With all these fine men taking their final vow, I'm afraid that just leaves Dick Shotgun Cheney chasing little George from room to room, and we have seen that movie before. It's called Home Alone. <laughs> and it is not pretty. Seriously, it is starting to look like our own old republic has a fighting chance. Give yourselves some credit for that. <laughs> Most of my own work as an activist has been spent trying to get big money out of our politics. Because I thought those big donor checks were a uh, a limiting, limiting the common man's access to his representatives in Congress. But who knew you could just go into an airport restroom and make your case? <laughs> I have gone to some great trouble that I could have avoided. I walked across the United States, for heaven's sake, when I could have done what? Tapped a shoe in the next stall. Though I'm sure it would have been a grand surprise. When Bob Day threatens to filibuster the reform McCain-Feingold bill, for which I walked, I went into his office on Capitol Hill with a long line of his unsavory contributors, 99 pages. And I read them in endless filibuster of my own. That was seven years ago. He withdrew his filibuster. When I was arrested once in the Capitol building for daring to read aloud, from the Bill of Rights in the Great Rotunda, and arrested again for reading from the Declaration of Independence itself, I had no idea that there were more direct ways to grab hold of a senator's attention. <laughs> like you, 
For all these past seven years, I have been most worried that our great republic was going to just go down like the Titanic. Like the Titanic. But a conservative friend of mine, we all agree to call them conservatives because we are humorous and good-natured people, said to me that our republic cannot possibly sink like the Titanic during a conservative government. I asked him why he was del and he was quite delighted to tell me the reason. No more icebergs. <laughs> and he said it very proudly. Quite so. Mission accomplished. Indeed, I think there are some overlooked bushy methods to all this bushy madness in that vein. I think I would be useful if I would tell you and us to help Mr. Bush define his legacy by identifying the Bush doctrine lurking behind his policies. For an example, our conservative occupant of the White House has recently offered a too little, too late band-aid for the home foreclosure crisis. That may appear insensitive or incompetent, but what better way to have fewer people stranded on rooftops in the future than to simply have fewer people with roofs over their heads in the first place. It is a simple math of bushy, tough love. And it is a textbook example of the genius behind what I call the first Bush doctrine. When we make our government, which is why we make our people stronger when we make our government as dysfunctional as possible. Let's face it. The agencies that have protected the environment, consumers, workers, miners, and protected the Bill of Rights and the rule of law itself are but crutches that enable weakness in our people. I keep thinking about us as a little tiny round ball in the middle circling around. It moves. And I think the air is so bad. The water is so bad. I never thought I'd get into A and P and see a whole line of bottled water. You've got to have water, you've got to have air in order to live. And we're ruining both. Let's face it, the agencies that have protected the environment and the Bill of Rights and the rule of law itself are but crutches that enable weakness in our people. If not for this first Bush doctrine, would we be here today standing up strongly for our beliefs and our rights and our future, and our safety, and our freedom. Why are we doing it? Well, we are doing it because the Justice Department and the EPA and the other bits of government we pay for sure in hell aren't doing anything. <laughs>